Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Hear God's word. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up, after he had given command through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And, whilst, and while saying with them, staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, these things, as they were looking on, he was li lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven he, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Amen. May the Lord have his blessing to that reading of his word. Well, as already suggested this morning, we're beginning a series in the book of Acts. And I've entitled the message this morning, A Glorious Farewell. A Glorious Farewell. We often find ourselves saying goodbye on many different occasions and to many different people for many, many different reasons. In fact, hardly a day goes by in our lives when we're not saying goodbye to somebody. Our daughter stayed with us for these last two nights and this morning we said goodbye to her as she left. She promises to come back. She promises to return. There will be a return, but right now there's a going. And so we say goodbye. And unless we're talking about a Christian funeral, in all of our goodbyes we expect to say hello at some future point. That the goodbye will be followed by an hello. And so you see in these little ways every day we act out the great truth of the gospel. That when the disciples farewelled Jesus, it was a goodbye. But the promise was that one day there would be an hello when he came back. So what we have here in Acts 1, 1 to 11, is a glorious farewell. What made this a glorious farewell? Well, <clears throat> Jesus was going to leave them with three things which would make for a glorious farewell. He was going to leave them uh, with a renewed understanding of the Scriptures. He was going to leave them with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he was going to leave them with the promise of a return, the promise of a second coming. 
Now, you'll, uh, you'll notice in the questions that are in the bulletin, questions regarding the sermon, uh, I've asked you to list four things. In fact, it should only be three. But I want you to spend the rest of the time agonizing over the fourth, which doesn't appear. So these are the three things. A renewed understanding of the Scriptures, a baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the promise of a return. And together these three make for a glorious farewell as Jesus ascends back to the Father. And the three things that Jesus left with them, Jesus also leaves with us. We too have these three things. So if you have your Bibles open at the book of Acts, far be it that you go from this place this morning having heard only my word, but rather the word of the true and the living God from the pages of his scripture. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after, going, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Notice there that the writer of the book of Acts, who we know to be none other than Luke himself, makes reference there in verse 1 to a former book, and that former book was, in fact, Luke's gospel. So Luke wrote two books in the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of Luke, which has his name, and he wrote the book of Acts, which doesn't bear his name in the title. But nevertheless, uh, in that former book, he also addressed the Gospel of Luke to the same individual, Theophilus. And he says to Theophilus here in verse 1 that in my former book, in my gospel, the gospel of Luke, I wrote about all the things Jesus began to do and teach. And now Luke is going to continue the story in the second volume of his work. He's going to continue the story of what Jesus is going to do and teach. What Jesus began to do in the gospel, he's going to continue to do in the book of Acts. So both accounts, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, both are accounts are about Jesus, about what Jesus did and what Jesus taught. And, and, and the Gospel, Jesus taught and did those things in his person. And in the book of Acts, he does them by way of his spirit. As he continues to give his apostles instructions by way of the Holy Spirit. And what is it that Jesus does in the book of Acts? What Jesus does is to establish the church through the preaching of the gospel. Where the, where the gospel goes, the church appears. That's the pattern in the book of Acts. Wherever the gospel goes, the church springs up, as it were, out of nothing. Where the gospel goes, the church appears. We believe and we belong. It's inconceivable in the book of Acts that there would be no church as a result of the preaching of the gospel. It's inconceivable in the book of Acts that the gospel that goes with the power of the Spirit would fall on deaf ears and hardened hearts, but rather it would go with converting power, and the result of that converting power would be the establishment of the church because first we believe and then we belong. And believing's the easy part. Belonging's the hard part, isn't it? Well, for some people it is. Maybe not for you. First we believe and then we belong because Jesus is at work and he has never stopped working. Verse 3. After his suffering, Jesus showed himself to these men, these apostles he had chosen, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. After his resurrection, Jesus remained on earth for a 40-day period of ministry to the apostles before he ascended to heaven. During that 40-day period, he taught his apostles and he proved himself to the apostles. He showed proofs that it was indeed him to the ones he had chosen. These apostles had been chosen for this 40-day period of ministry because they were the ones who were to teach the new believers who very soon now were going to flood into the new church by the thousand. When Peter 
preached his first sermon, 3,000 were converted. When I preached my first sermon, three people gave their condolences. Any day now, thousands were going to flood into this new church. So Jesus took time out to instruct the apostles so that the apostles could instruct these new believers. So he showed them the proof of his resurrected body since they were witnesses of his resurrection. And he taught them about the kingdom of God that they might pass this teaching on. And you know, we don't have to go to Acts chapter 2. We only have to take a little uh, dip our toe into the water of the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we read this about the new believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Well, what was the apostles' teaching? They devoted themselves. What was this teaching? It was the teaching primarily from this 40-day period between the resurrection and the ascension. Notice it says there in verse 3, at the end of verse 3, that he spent this 40-day period speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, if you just bear with me for a moment and go to the very end of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 28, the last two verses in the book of Acts, Acts 28, verse 30. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to him. The very last verse in the book of Acts. Behold, and boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and talked about the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the very first verse of the book of Acts, Jesus himself talking about the kingdom of God. In the very last verse of the book of Acts, the apostle Paul talking about the kingdom and the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the whole book of Acts is a teaching about the kingdom of God. The whole of the book of Acts unpacks for us the teaching about the kingdom of God. The whole book of Acts is an expansion of that 40-day teaching ministry that Jesus gave his disciples. He spent 40 days teaching them about the kingdom of God and they spent the whole of the book of Acts unfolding it and expanding it for the new church. Well, since this 40 days of teaching make up the content of the book of Acts and of the apostolic ministry generally, we should go back to Luke's Gospel and take a look at the content of this 40-day teaching. So we're going to come back to Acts 1, but... Uh, Let's go back for a moment to the last chapter in Luke's Gospel, Luke 24. And here we're going to see the overlap between these two books. Luke's last words in his Gospel became the first words in the book of Acts that he wrote. See, the connection was very organic. It was very real. In Luke's mind, the two were really one work. The second one picked up with the first one finished off. So in Luke 24, verse 36... While they were still talking about this, that's about the resurrection appearances that they had heard reported on, verse 36, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet and while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and of the prophets and of the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. That's Luke's summary of the 40-day ministry. Look particularly at verse 44 and 45. He said to them, This is what I told you when I was still with you, 
Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. You see, Jesus was going to use this, this time, his last 40 days with them, before ascending back to the Father. He was going to use this time to show them, to teach them, how all the scriptures spoke of the events they were now witnessing. How all that Jesus said and did was a fulfillment of all that the scriptures had spoken. Now this word fulfillment is a favorite word of Luke's. If you go to the very beginning of Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1 verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. See that word fulfilled there? Luke, is, as he begins writing his gospel, he lets his readers know that he is writing about what has been fulfilled. He is writing about what has been fulfilled, been fulfilled among us. And, and where did Luke get this information? He got it from the apostles. He got it from those who from the first were eyewitnesses. So he got it from the apostles and now he's passing it on to the believers that was, was fulfilled among them. So you see from the beginning of his gospel to the very end of his gospel, Luke presents Jesus as the fulfillment of what is all that has gone before. In case the disciples missed it during his three years of ministry, Jesus impresses it upon them during those 40 days. Remember that lovely story in Luke chapter 4 when Jesus was at the synagogue in Nazareth and he opened the scroll and he read from Isaiah and what did he say? The state, all these things are fulfilled in your hearing. See, that word keeps cropping up again and again. And now in these 40 days, Jesus was going to teach the disciples how in Jesus Christ, everything in the scriptures has been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. He is the spirit-anointed Messiah come to set his people free. Now you, you'll know from reading the Gospels, the disciples did not, did not understand all this significance and implication of Jesus being the fulfillment. And so... Jesus took these 40 days before his ascension to show them from all the scriptures how he fulfilled all that the scriptures has spoken. And, and you can, you see, as they listened, for those 40 days as they listened, and, and during that time they would, they would eat together. We know that from the pastors there in Luke. They would eat together and they would listen to Jesus' teaching. And while they were eating with him and while they were listening to them, they were looking at the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. Now that would have added power to the message, wouldn't it? That would have added power to the teaching. I mean, this just wasn't any regular rabbi giving them a scripture lesson. Standing before them as the resurrected body of Jesus, bearing glorious humanity, speaking from the scriptures that word of fulfillment. The power and glory of God was on display for those 40 days before their eyes and in their hearts. And so their hearts burned within them as Jesus opened up the scriptures to their minds. They were given a whole new way of understanding the Bible. That all of it is a word about Jesus Christ, his life, his ministry, his suffering, his death, the spread of the gospel and his glorious resurrection and ascension back to the Father. And the disciples were convinced. And they became witnesses of this great truth. That it is on Jesus Christ alone that God fulfills his redemptive purposes for all mankind. That's the truth on which the church and the book of Acts was built. That's the truth they went throughout the known world proclaiming everywhere. That's the truth that draws men and women and boys and girls into the new life of Jesus Christ. That's the truth that was further explained in the epistles by these men, epistles that were yet to be written. This is the truth that will be seen by all mankind when the Lord Jesus returns again in power and glory. This is the truth that must be proclaimed from every pulpit in the land and from the mouth 
of every believer that in Jesus Christ alone is the power and presence of God come among his people to fulfill every promise that God has ever made since the dawn of time. That's the first thing they were given. They were given the scriptures with a renewed understanding that would undergird their life and ministry from this time forward. Verse 4 of Acts chapter 1. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now notice verse 4 begins, in the version that I'm reading, on one occasion while he was eating with them. So we take that as being due, part, this is part of the 40-day period when they would meet together and they would eat together. And on one occasion, when they were eating together during that 40-day period, and look at the beginning of verse 6. So when they met together, again, when they were gathered together during the 40-day period, they asked him questions. Here they were given the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now they did not understand what this gift of the Holy Spirit was going to mean. So they asked him if it meant a restoration of the earthly fortunes of Israel. Verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will, will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now Jesus makes it explicit. He makes it very clear that the power they will receive from this Holy Spirit gift will not be a power for political or military conquest. It will be a powerful witness. It would make them into a powerful witnesses. They would make them into men whose witness would have great power. A witness to all they'd been taught in the 40 days of teaching. Yes, the kingdom of Israel will be restored, but not in the way that you imagined. Jesus was saying to them, but be restored as you witness to the kingdom of God that has come among you in Holy Spirit power. As the kingdom message is preached and the gospel is believed and the church is established throughout the world by the power of God, so the kingdom will be restored to Israel, but not the Israel of old, but the new Israel, the church of Jesus Christ, as God establishes and extends his reign in the hearts of believers. So he promised them the gift of the Holy Spirit to empower their witness. It's at this point now you begin to see the link between the scriptures and the Holy Spirit. He gave them a renewed understanding of the scriptures and he gave them the gift of of the Holy Spirit. You see, one would be of no use without the other. One would be of no use without the other. Both must be in place before the ministry of the kingdom can begin. They must teach from the scriptures and the Holy Spirit must be present in their teaching if they are to bear witness with converting power. God will show himself faithful to bless with converting power the witness to scriptural truth about Jesus. God will show himself faithful to bless with converting power the witness to scriptural truth about Jesus. Have you ever wondered about the fact that Christian leaders and preachers who don't believe what you believe yet seem to have greatly blessed ministries? People flock. Many are converted. Money runs like water. The blessing seems overwhelming. And yet as we listen to these people teach and preach, we find ourselves in our own hearts saying, that doesn't sound right. I'm not comfortable with that. I'd have great difficulty sitting under that ministry, and yet look how God is blessing it. What do you do with that? God will show himself faithful to bless with converting power the witness to the scriptural truth about Jesus. When God blesses a ministry, it's got nothing to do with the man. When God blesses a ministry, it's got nothing to do with the man. 
When God blesses a ministry, it is God showing himself faithful to the scriptures. As Jesus Christ is presented, the Holy Spirit will be there with power. You remember that uh, little account in the book of Philippians where the Apostle Paul was talking about other preachers who were preaching with impure motive. And Paul said he was glad for that. Now, he didn't mean that he was glad that they had impure motives. He was glad because as the Scriptures are preached, God will show himself faithful to bless the preaching of the Scriptures. It's got nothing to do with the man. It's got everything to do with God's commitment and faithfulness to bless with spirit power the unfolding of the Scriptures about Jesus Christ. So that's what he was promising these men. As you take these scriptures and as you hold up Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of all these scriptures have spoken, my promise to you is that my Holy Spirit will be present in converting and life-changing power. That was their confidence. And so this gospel witness that will begin in Jerusalem and spread out to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth will go way beyond the boundaries of old Israel. This will be a kingdom for the world, not just for Israel, or as we read earlier in the service, I will make your light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And the rest of the book of Acts tells the story of this wonderful promise as the gospel goes global. This is the structure of their mission and of the book of Acts as it begins in Jerusalem and ends in Rome. The gospel begins in Jerusalem, the capital city of the Jews, and goes all the way to Rome the capital city of the Gentiles. But before the promised Holy Spirit can come, Jesus has to go. Jesus will go back to heaven, and at that point the Holy Spirit will be sent to the apostles by both the Father and the Son. See, Jesus has to go back so he can send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit won't be sent from heaven until Jesus is back in heaven to send the Holy Spirit. So Jesus has to go back in order to send the Spirit, and the Spirit comes sent from the Father and the Son. So what these men will have will be the Scriptures given to them by Jesus and the Holy Spirit given to them by Jesus. And it's all about Jesus. Jesus gives both. The Scriptures that speak of him and the Holy Spirit that speaks of him. But that's not all. There's the third thing. They will also receive the promise that Jesus himself will one day come back. The promise of a return, the promise of a second coming. Now Luke records the ascension in two different places. He records it here in the book of Acts and he records it at the end of his gospel. So we're just going to take a brief look at these two ascension accounts, beginning with Acts 1 verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And then the end of Luke's gospel. Luke 24, 50. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually in the temple praising God. Now you put those two accounts together, make it a composite account, and you'll see much of the details surrounding the event of the ascension. And one thing that both accounts both say is that Jesus went up. Jesus went up. And they looked up and saw Jesus going up. Where did Jesus go? Well, he went up. And he went up not because heaven is necessarily up there somewhere to be found by spaceships. But by going up and going out of their sight, they were witnessing a complete removal 
of the person of Jesus from the earth. So they wouldn't go looking for him. They wouldn't go looking for him around Palestine. They wouldn't send a mission across the Mediterranean and go looking for Jesus. I wonder where he's disappeared to. They saw him go up and out of their sight. They knew wherever he had gone, he had certainly left the earth. He was no longer here on this earth. And yet, they were in the temple praising and worshipping God because they'd seen Jesus go. How could that be? How could they be that happy about seeing Jesus go? How could they be that happy about seeing Jesus gone from this earth? He was gone and they saw him go. He went back to the Father. He went back to where God is. And for what purpose? Why did Jesus return to the Father? Well, the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus has gone back into the heavenly temple as a great high priest to intercede before the Father on our behalf. Having won our salvation by his death and resurrection, he now presents that salvation before the throne in heaven by the continual presentation of his own body, forever scarred with the wounds of our redemption. This wonderful and glorious reality, unseen by us, for now, is pictured in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, which is the replica on earth of the throne room in heaven. And he goes in there to present the blood of the sacrifice offered on behalf of the people for their sin. But before he goes in, he lifts up his arms and he blesses the people. And then he disappears. He goes in. And, and, and all the people are waiting outside. Well, what are they waiting for? They're waiting for him to come back. He's gone in there with the blood of the sacrifice. He has blessed them with the assurance that by taking this blood in, their sins will be forgiven, but they're waiting. They're waiting for the priest to come back. And when he appears, he blesses them again with the assurance that the sacrifice had been accepted and their sins are forgiven. Then the people can go home. That's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does. Remember, it's all about fulfillment. That's what Jesus does. Jesus fulfills the Old Testament foreshadow, and there we saw in Luke's gospel account, before he goes, he lifts up his hands and he blesses the apostles before ascending and entering the throne room on high, where as great high priest, he will present himself as a sacrifice offered up in our place. Before he goes, he blesses us and tells us that the sacrifice he's about to offer will be accepted. But we're waiting. We're waiting. Just like they waited back there in the Old Testament. We are waiting for our high priest to reappear when he will bless us again with the assurance that he's coming in power and glory in an accomplished and fulfilled salvation. At the beginning of Luke's gospel, Zechariah was a priest in Jerusalem. And Zechariah was taking his turn to go into the temple and offer up prayers on behalf of the people. And while he was inside, the worshippers waited outside for his return. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 8. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. He was going in there to pray, to pray on behalf of the people. And when the time came for the burning of incense, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. He was in there praying for the people, and they were outside praying for themselves. But while Zechariah was inside, an angel appeared to him and told him his wife was going to have a baby. Now Zechariah had trouble believing the angel undoubted this good news, and as a rebuke and as a reminder of his doubt, Zechariah lost the power of speech. 
uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 19. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah. They were waiting for the priest to come back. Wondering why he stayed so long. When he came out, he could not speak to them. The crowd were waiting for Zechariah to return that he might bless them. But he had been struck dumb and would remain so until the baby was born. You see what Luke has done? Luke has begun his gospel with a priest who is unable to bless his people. And he ends his gospel with a greater priest who gives the blessing to his people, a far greater blessing, the blessing of fulfillment, before he enters the true tabernacle, the true temple of heaven, and the Holy Spirit can be sent and the mission can begin. And while they're in heaven, Jesus represents our humanity as he stands clothed in a glorious humanity. Our humanity is linked to his humanity. We too are up there hidden in Christ and raised to heavenly places. Thou hast raised our human nature in the clouds to God's right hand. There we sit in heavenly places, there with thee in glory stand. Jesus reigns, adored by angels. Man with God is on the throne. Mighty Lord, in thy ascension we by faith behold our own our own humanity in the heavenly places linked to Jesus. So the disciples will have the scriptures to tell about Jesus. They will have the Holy Spirit to empower their message and convert many. And they will have the promise from two angels sent by God that Jesus will one day come back on the same clouds that took him out of their sight. No wonder, as Luke's gospel tells us, they spent their days worshipping and praising God in the temple as they waited for the Holy Spirit to come. It had indeed been a glorious farewell, both for them and for us. Amen. Let's pray briefly. Father God, we thank you once again from our hearts that the, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ was so concerned to minister the scriptures to the hearts of his apostles that he delayed his ascension for those 40 days. We thank you, Father, that the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, is just as concerned to minister the scriptures to the hearts of your people. As we hear again and again the apostolic word expounded, you bless us, you encourage us, you draw us by faith into Jesus Christ as we wait for that glorious return of a priest, a greater priest, who can bless us with the greater blessing of fulfillment. Father, we pray that, that even this week we would be encouraged to pray to you, to confess our sins to you, to bring to you the concerns and the heartaches and the anxieties of our hearts, knowing that our humanity is forever linked with the humanity that is in heaven, that Jesus is our man in heaven. He's there on our behalf. Lord, that would greatly encourage us as we, as we develop our prayer life this week, that you would reassure us in our hearts that all that Jesus Christ has done for his people belong to us and all the promises that you have made to your people you have made to each one of us. We thank you for this glorious fulfillment. In Jesus' name, amen.